Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is the fifth presentation brought to you by the Friends of ASM Collections, organized by the Programs and Social Events Committee, chaired by Susan Thompson and Jen Tillman. Today's uh, talk promises to be a visual delight as well as entertaining and educational experience. So today's uh, speaker is Eric Minling, and he tells us that in 1992, at the age of 23, he left home in the US and moved to Southern Mexico following an inner calling that he didn't know yet how to name. He immersed himself in the world of traditional people, old time potters, weavers, and smoky kitchen chefs and felt like he found home. What was calling him, he came to understand, was a search for rootedness, connection to community and place, and a desire to learn quiet old lessons from what he calls our grandmother cultures. Without trying, they teach us things we truly need to know, things that we forgot so long ago that we don't even know that they're gone. Author, photographer, and entrepreneur, Eric founded a cultural tourism company called Tradition Mexico. He's written two books, Fire and Clay, The Art of Oaxacan Pottery, and the award-winning Oaxaca Stories in Cloth, which we'll be hearing about today. I met Eric while participating in several of his fantastic trips. So with that, uh, take it away, Eric. Okay. Hello all, thank you for taking some time out to come and hang out with us here in this uh, modern chat room. Diane, nice to see you again. Uh, thank you for hosting. Thank you for making a space for this conversation. I'm going to lean right into this and I invite you all to join me on this journey. It will be beautiful, hopefully interesting. So as Diane alludes long, long ago, I went to live in Southern Mexico and journey around that country uh, which is an amazing place. I have been blessed. I've been blessed to meet so much beautiful humanity. And some of them I met while I was doing a certain kind of fashion photography. They were women of gray hair and braids and ribbons. And they had well-earned wrinkles and deeply rooted fashion. Beautiful grandmothers. In my eyes, some of the most beautiful grandmothers in the world. I spent two years of my life photographing people and their look but not just any people, nor just any look. As I'm saying, my focus was very specific. This state in Southern Mexico called Oaxaca, where I spent half of my life. And the Oaxaca is not a big land. It is no larger than Indiana or Hungary. It is a place of immense cultural diversity, where among the original people, 16 languages are spoken. In those languages, there are all over 170 variants. And old human ways of being and doing persist. And in some of the communities of Oaxaca, there continues to be a culture of dress and adornment, something I call community fashion, that was once common around the world. This is now rare as a rare Himalayan snow leopard. Community fashion is a style of dress shared in common by members of the community, the town. It's a collective identity. It is not uncommon that the clothing is made by the very people of those communities, and often the design is filled with symbolic meaning dreamt into being over the generations, stories and cloth. That like language are dynamic and slowly evolving. These were the people who I wanted to recognize. Theirs was the fashion I wanted to honor through my photography. So I traveled to every village and town I could find in Oaxaca where people continue to dress in the singular clothing of their community on a day-to-day -day basis. And this detail was important to me on a day-to-day -day basis. I was looking for places where dress was still alive, not just brought out for costume, not just brought out once a year, but this is what they wore as they've worn for generations. So all told, I photographed in 57 different communities, making over 200 portraits. But I need to confess something to you as I speak about fashion, about this fashion-focused photographic project. Fashion, clothing, dress is not actually the motive of this photographic project. No, my motives uh, for doing this work lay elsewhere. And I'm gonna try to answer that or explain those motives uh, through this simple question. And the question is, what does the sagebrush know that the tumbleweed doesn't? What does the sagebrush know that the tumbleweed doesn't? It goes something like this. I was born in Reno, Nevada. 
My mother was born in Los Angeles, California, and my father was born in Nevada, California. My mother's father was born in Oklahoma, and my father's mother was born in Chicago. My great-grandparents were born, I don't know where they were born. My dad studied university in Reno, which is where he met my mom and how I came to be there. Though neither of them live there anymore. And I studied university in Arcata, California, but don't live there anymore either. Don't worry, there's not going to be a quiz on this. But as I look at this snapshot of my recent family history, what I see are so many tumbleweeds blowing westward. A tumbleweed takes seed in a certain place, grows for a time, and then when the wind is right, where the trunk meets the soil, it breaks off at the roots and begins its rolling ways, catching on something here or there as it goes, staying for a while, and then moving on with the next big gust. For Americans, at least, I don't think my tumbleweed ways are particularly unusual. Many of us have been blown in from somewhere else not so long ago. We're all immigrants from another place drawn to this one by one thing or another, perhaps bound to leave sooner or later. But I have always wondered, what would it be like to really be from my place? I mean, I kind of know because of course I am from a place. I was born on the Eastern side of the Sierra Nevadas where the wide and long desert valleys are carpeted by an iconic Western plant called sagebrush, where summer rains mixed with the shimmering heat coming off of the soil, invigorating it with sharp, warm smell of sagebrush, this perfume of the earth. I swear, if they ever have to open my heart for any reason, that's what it's gonna smell like. Summer rain on sagebrush. This place has marked me forever perhaps in the way of birth fruit marks the salmon. But I was only like a tumbleweed there. I was dropped in place by another tumbleweed. And my fast growing trunk soon enough broke off at the roots and away I rolled. All around me grew that sagebrush, firmly rooted to its place on earth, staying right there from year to year and for centuries. And I wonder, what does the sagebrush know that the tumbleweed what is it like to have roots that go deep into the soil, drawing nutrients from the earth and summer rains? What would it be like to be born to a place where your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents were from? People who intimately knew the hills and valleys and neighborhoods around. depended on those hills and valleys and neighborhoods for their well-being. What would it be like to be fed by generational knowledge and stories about that place? What if the food you ate came directly from the, land, from the land around you, as much a part of it as your mother's voice was a part of you. And the language of your mother was the spoken echo of this one unique place on earth, the language of a grand community. Clothing, clothing too would be this way, going way back. It was a direct offshoot of the land around. Was there cotton, wool, silk, linen, sisal, hemp? What colors could be teased from the flowers and barks and seeds? What dreams were woven into the design? Was the clothing, like the stories about the old timers, the food on your table, or the way you spoke become a symbol of belonging to a place and people, like a flag draped over your shoulders and worn on your hips that said, I am of we, and we are of here. What kind of sense of self, like this clear connection to a place, a family, a community give you? This is a question I silently asked myself my entire life. Perhaps better put, there has been a hunger in my being, a sense of loss for something I've never even had, something that is only defined by a negative space inside, that over time I've come to understood arises from the ambiguity being roots. It is this sense of loss within me, this hunger that is the genesis of this photographic project, and indeed much of what I've done in my life. But isn't it true that we're hungry we try to feed ourselves? For me, the clearest, most beautiful way to characterize this somewhat intangible thing called heritage and belonging, these roots, is through photos of the people and their community fashion. People who understand belonging roots, excuse me, people who understand belonging 
and roots. <sighs> yeah, I understand breathing. So though the focus of this work, the focus of what I've done would appear to be fashion, clothing. The story that this clothing tells for me is not so much one of how people dress, but what is symbolized by dressing in a way shared in common by the members of one's village. Clothing becomes a flag of community, a statement of belonging. Look at this beautiful woman. This is from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. A way of dress, a way of adornment that goes back a number of centuries. Clothing is this flag. I am of this place. And it is a proud woven link to deep ancient layers of artistic heritage. And in each and every one of these rooted communities, one's parents, grandparents, and great grandparents were also from there. Knowing that they are members of an extended family, the oldest and most perfect human support system. This is how we were made to live. And likewise, part of an interwoven circle of community. And benefiting in that community from amazing food. Here, is a picture of a gathering of women preparing a meal for a wedding. And that, that meal is called chichila. It's a, a, a related to mole, if you're familiar with mole sauce. Cooked up, we served in hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. Community up, this interwoven circle. Together we join, together we create. To live in such places where so many generations of one's ancestors have lived is to live in the fertile compost of layer upon layer of stories, generations of being and experience, stuff of lifetimes enriching the roots. I traveled into such communities, one after another, over a two year period, to collect visual stories with my camera and spoken stories with my ears. And that body of work collectively became the content of the book that was mentioned, Wahaka Stories and Clock. So many stories, so many experiences. I met Josefina Tomas in the village of San Sebastian, excuse me, San Felipe Usila. Those of you who are familiar with the cordery work uh, will know that they really focused on this beautiful village. They drove there from the city of Oaxaca, I believe it was in the 40s, and it took them days and days to get there. And when I drove there, it took maybe nine hours. Things have changed, but the dressway is still alive. Uh, Josefina stands here. I photographed her outside of her home on a little street. And as I photographed her, she beamed this pride. Look at her pride. Her pride in being recognized, her pride in her dress. And then she'd look from left to right, left to right, to see if any of the neighbors were seeing her because she was also very self-conscious that here's this man photographing her. But she was so happy and so proud. And her clothing tells many stories, but one of the straightforward stories it tells is of using clothing and using it up. If you look closely, you'll see around her belly, a patch from another we peel from another blouse. She wore the one that, let's call it the primary we peel so much that it wore out that center part and she patched it from another we peel. Um, so in a, in a sense, it becomes like a quilt. This woman is Modesta Fermin from the Isla Soyaltepec. What a beautiful world we live in. Look at this place in the rainy, rainy side of Oaxaca. As I was photographing Modesta, like so many people, like myself, she didn't know what to do with her hands. She was self-conscious. Uh, so I said, catch one of your chickens and hold that. She had chickens running all around her. She held that, and then she felt at ease. <sighs> okay. And I photographed her with that smile of humor and joy and a bit of embarrassment. Dionisia Ambrosia from the village of San Cristobal at Chiriwag. She is dressed in white on white with a beautiful red sash, cotton, almost like uh, a toga, some royal, royal ancient garment. And she's holding court over her store. She runs this small town store where everything can be had from sandals to a tape measure to orange juice. And she lives in this valley in the mountains of Oaxaca that I call the Valley of the White Cranes. Because in one after another, after another village in this valley, the women dress in a variant of white on white. Each village does it differently but each village does it similarly by dialects of a language. At the head of the valley, there's a village that is the old market town. And I met a woman in that old market town, a grandmother, and she said, you know, in the old days, when the dressways were much more alive, the women would come in on market day 
and they'd come down the trails from here and they'd come down the road from there and they'd come in the trail from there. And they would look like so many white cranes coming down to descend on this pond. This was the mark. And so I think of this place as the Valley of White Cranes. And these are, uh, let's call them negatives from other pictures I took in that valley. Women from each of these villages, variants of white on white, all neighbors, all united, all distinctive as well. Another series of villages, same valley, La Chiriwag, Solaga. Over the mountain, another language is spoken, the Mijes. This is Genoveva Perez, the village of Camazulapan, the Espiritu Santo. Genoveva is not standing there with my camera. She's standing there with her camera. She is a videographer and she makes a living by filming weddings, by filming celebrations in different villages, by filming the rodeos in her region and then selling the, CV, uh, the, the, the DVDs in the market. She has a camera and then I went and visited her, um, her studio. She had this beautiful matte screen that as my ambitions as a photographer made me jealous. I want, a, I want a screen like yours, Genoveva. She said, you work hard and you'll get one. And dress smart too. She said, take off these jeans and the t-shirt. That's not a good look for you. This is Petra Jimenez, Laguna Guadalupe, Chicahuasla. Uh, these are Trique people. One of the things I love about this picture is that it tells the story of what this clothing is for. It's for living in. The clothing that we wear is for living. It is for working in. She is collecting firewood and carrying it in the field in a wipil, in a blouse that she wove for herself on a backstrap loom. It probably took her six months to weave that. And she will wear it until it wears out. And she may have three of these. And the older one is the one she works in. And the newer one she, is the one she parties in. But can you imagine spending six months to make something and then wearing it to go and chop firewood with a machete? If you can imagine that, you understand the world. You understand how clothing is so important, so part of you. This is Pascual, perdón, Pascual Perez Luis, uh, Santa Maria Zacatepec, Mixtec people. I met him through his granddaughter, a friend of mine, Rosalba Perez. And Rosalba was telling me, you know, in the old days in my village, we used to grow cotton. We used to spin that cotton. We used to weave the cotton that we, that we grew and spun. We've lost that. We've largely lost that. Although many women weave in this village, they're weaving with industrial thread. Times have changed. But Rosalba, this woman in her early 20s, said, I want to bring back what we used to do because what we used to do is part of who I am and I don't want to lose it. And so she spoke with her grandfather and her grandfather said, yes, I remember the old cotton we used to have here, but it's disappeared. It's gone. She said, grandfather, let's find this cotton. It must exist somewhere. And they searched and they searched and they searched. In one of the outlying little hamlets, next to one of the houses there, they saw the cotton bush growing cotton that's distinctive to this specific place on earth. And her grandfather started farming it next to his cornfield. He started dedicating part of his cornfield to cotton. You can see the corn growing up on one side of him, but he's surrounded by the cotton plants. And it's a natural brown cotton. It's an incredibly long fiber. And any of you who are familiar with spinning know that long fiber makes for easier spinning. It also makes for a stronger thread. And so now they started to revive it and bring it back. And this is a beautiful story. It's a rare example, but a beautiful one of the youngest generation or younger generation saying, let's not let go of this thing for the dazzling modern world. Let's hang on to who we are and what we have. And so granddaughter connects with grandfather and this cotton comes alive. As a side note, the genetic origin of 95% of the cotton used on earth for the cotton that we commercially use sources from the Pacific coast of Mexico. Um, so there are old, old roots and important roots to this cotton. Crispina Suarez from San Bartolome Ayautla, uh, in the far reaches of the mountains of Oaxaca. She told me the story of the roof behind her, that roof made of straw. And she said, before the highway came through here in the 70s, there was a way that we did things in this village called the Mano Vuelta way. Mano Vuelta means exchange of service, exchange of labor. And so collectively, we would build, among other things, we would build the roofs for our house. And on roof day, the men would have gone and they would cut bundles of grass from the hills all around. And then they'd get up early and on roofing day, some men would be down on the ground where the bundles of grass were. Some men would be up on the rafters of the roof and they'd be throwing those bundles of grass up. 
and the men on the top would be tying the bundles, and the men below would be throwing them up, tying them down. And she said, among those bundles of grass, there was often a bottle of aguardiente, of cane alcohol. And that would get thrown up and tossed back down and thrown up and tossed back down over the course of the day. Because you have to keep the work cheery. Because work is play. Because life is to be celebrated. Because making a roof at a house is a momentous moment. And what better way than this godly elixir? But she also said the house roof would... Well, imagine this. In the morning, you prepare your son to go to school. And you comb his hair all very nicely. And you slick it down with a little bit of grease. And off he goes to school. And he spends his day at school. And when he comes back, in one way or another, he just doesn't look the same. And his hair is all tussled and tussled about. You try to comb it straight again. She said, the roof where it was in the morning begun looks like your son when he goes to school. And at the end of the day, when that liquor has gone down, it looks like your son when he came home all tussled about. But it's the character of the roof. And she said, those of us who are the homeowner, we provided the meal. And we fed them all day long. We provided that bottle of liquor that went back and forth. And then we would go help our neighbors. I'm not a what the system. Um, our closest comparison might be an Amish barn raising. She said the highway came through and this custom disappeared and the money market, uh, the money system. came. And now you want a roof, you have to pay for the roof. You pay two guys, you pay the labor, they spend a week doing it. It gets done, it's good, it works, but we've lost some of the interconnectedness that we used to have. This gentleman, Crescencio Marino, from the village called Santiago Ixtayuca, very remote, very remote in the mountains of Oaxaca. One of the few places where men still dress in the way of their community. Very, very rare to see this anymore. And Crescencio, as I was photographing him, I noticed his machete. And I noticed that the machete blade was rusted. Now, to see a rusted machete blade tells you that he's not sharpening his blade. That's a curious thing to see because all farmers keep their blades sharp. It's their main tool. And I asked him why his blade was, rust was rusted on the side. He said, ah. My blade is rusty and dull because my eyes have become rusty and dull. I've thrown cataracts and I can't see anymore. I can't see anymore, so I can't work in the fields. What use do I have of this machete? I rely on others now to survive. And he sits around the house and he sits in his memories. Petra Gomez from Texas, Tlaui Toltepec, Mije woman. She stands, so to speak, in her field of cattle. Each of these enormous agave plants, she milks, quote unquote. She cores the heart of them out and collects the juice, the sap that gathers there. And she makes pulque out of it. It's like a sourdough. It's a fermented drink that then is served in those gourds like the one she's holding in her hand. It's mildly al um, alcoholic and incredibly rich in nutrients. And she has made her living, as have her neighbors in this village, by making pulque and selling it generation after generation after generation. And that is literally her lifeblood all around her. The clothing she's wearing, the traditional dress of Tlaui Kotepec, um, you can see the stars in the middle of it. And those stars, an old, old design, they symbolize agave plants. This is the land of, among other things, agaves. There are also hills, it speaks of the mountains they live in. There are bundles of corn, which is that sacred food. There are rivers, zigzags that represent water, the waterways, these essential elements of life. The clothing speaks of it. So much of the clothing we're seeing here speaks of old, ancient, sacred stories, speaks of place on earth, speaks of who this person is and her station in life. This is Gavina, Antonio, Isla Soyaltepec. I love this picture. She, this, is, this is warm, tropical climate. She has flowers. This is just in front of her house. Flowers in her yard, flowers on her wheel. But if you look at her face, Look at the sadness in that face as she looks out on that lake. She told me the story of that lake. This lake is not a lake, it's a reservoir. This, this reservoir was built in the 60s. And what used to be mountaintops became island. It's called Mil Islas, the, the Thousand Island Lake. And she lives on the top of this island. And she's looking down at the place where her village used to be. She's looking down at the place where the trails were that she grew up. She's looking down at the place where she had the first, the first, the first heart flutter when she met a young man. She's looking down at the place where her children were. 
and it's all underwater. She told me the story. She said, they came and they told us, they came and they told us they were going to dam the lake. They came and they told us that we had to move. We had to move to the top of the mountain. We had to leave. But we were not going to leave this place, this home that we had built, these fields that we had cultivated, the soil beyond there where my parents and my grandparents were buried. Why would we leave this place? This is our place. They came again and told us to leave. She said, in some places, the army came with weapons and they forced the people to leave. That didn't happen here. We didn't believe what they were saying about it all going underwater. We couldn't even imagine it. We stayed. And it was in the summertime when the crops were growing high in the fields, the corn. And then the water started coming in. And we hoped and we prayed that it would not rise anymore. She said it was nighttime. It was nighttime when it started coming into the house. It's an earthen house. It was already knee deep in the fields and into the house. And the house began to melt. Of course, she left. She says, some people say this lake is beauty, but what I see in this lake is sorrow. I've lost my place of origin. She's fortunate. She is fortunate that she just got to move up the hill. And that hill is the place of the old temple, the old temple that belongs to way out the heaven. But that lake buries so many memories. It is a place where people were once corn farmers and grain farmers, and now uh, they're tilapia fisher people. Life changes. Ah, Regulo Quiroz Nicolás, this man I have known for years. I never knew his name was Regulo. He always went by Juan. But when I asked him, Regulo, you're going to be in a book. Give me your formal name. He said, ah, it is Regulo Quiroz Nicolás. And I went to photograph him on a Sunday. I went to photograph him at this place where he works. And of course, it's Sunday, so he's not working. It's Sunday, but he said, I'll meet you there. But it's Sunday, and on Sunday, I walk into town. And I take some of my money and I buy something to drink and I smoke a cigarette and I purchase something and I watch the world. He lives way out in the rural countryside. What does he do? He's a farmer. This is tropical land. He grows sugarcane and mangoes and avocados. And that thing that he's leaning on is a trapiche, a sugarcane press. So he ties a horse to that long arm that's sticking out and it goes round and round and drives the gears of this machine, which squeezes the juice out of the sugarcane which collects in that tin underneath that, and then it's boiled. If you can imagine making maple syrup, you boil it and you boil it and you boil it down. That sugar cane is boiled down to get what is authentic brown sugar, uh, panela or piloncillo. Um, but on this day, he was not working. Nonetheless, he swept the patio for the photo. All the leaves were falling off the mango tree. And then he stood there with great pride and said, yes, photograph me in this Brown cotton, traditional men's shirt from the Mishtek people of the coast, hand spun cotton, hand woven by his wife, and uh, ready to go and strut in town. Aurelia Cruz from Laguna Guadalupe, Chicahuasla. She said, I raised my daughters. I raised my daughters in the way we raise our daughters. I raised them to know how to make tortillas. I raised them to know how to cook. I raised them to know how to weave. I raised them so that they would be the kind of women that we want to be in our village traditionally so that we provide what we need to provide for this place. And my daughters learn all these things and they can make tortillas and they can weave and they know our stories. But my daughters wanted to study. She said they wanted to study and they wanted to go and study university far away. So I spoke about this with my husband. I said, yes, let them go and study. We have a little bit of money from the sales of our textiles and from our fields. And the universities are subsidized. She said, my daughter went and studied. Ah, oh, she scratched her head. What did she study? Como se llama? Ingeniera química. Chemical engineering, she said. That's what she studied. And such is the case. And this daughter now works at a regional hospital in the clinic, in the lab, doing chemical studies on lab results, making money and then coming home and weaving weaving during vacation and weaving on the weekends. Many stories that I heard in these travels, many beautiful stories, some sad. But the most common theme from village to village and household to household was that of generosity. And those of you who have traveled in places like Mexico know this to be the case. Generosity is abundant. This woman from the village of San Blas of Tempa, Zapotec village in the Isthmus of Oaxaca, she's offering what looks like to uh, my North American eyes, peach halves and syrup, but those are mango halves in a syrup of chile and sugar, absolutely delicious. She makes them herself. 
again and again and again as one travels the rural pathways. This is how you are met. Come, sit, and something hot and tasty in bowls is brought from a smoky kitchen where it's been cooked over the fire. Generosity, welcome, hit the load off, stay for a while, talk, tell me of where you are from, who you are. In all the places I visited, these, these 57 villages, there was a nice little handful of villages where the dressways were alive and well, where multiple generations were still dressing in the way of their community. Um, in the case of the Zapotecs of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, this village, Tehuantepec, uh, the dressways are absolutely thriving, particularly for fiesta. Uh, this is not day-to-day -day dress. She has dressed up uh, for fashion, for, for, me, for fiesta. And one of the days I was there, I heard all this noise two blocks from my hotel in the plaza. I go out there to the plaza and I see hundreds of young women like her dressed like this, just stunningly gorgeous. And they were celebrating the anniversary of their high school. And um, this is how you dress up. Now, if you are familiar with Frida Kahlo fashion, this looks like how Frida Kahlo dressed. Frida Kahlo dressed this style from this community, from the women of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Its origin is here. Um, and they still walk it with pride, as seen here. This is a different way of dressing, the same community. She's dressed in velvet with embroidered flowers and gold around her neck, that gold, uh, our old American gold coins, which were the commerce used in this area a uh, century ago. It was a wealthy area that transported goods from the eastern to the western side of the United States because it was the Isthmus. So all this commerce came from Panama Canal. And so gold and silver coins became part of what people had there. And they would start wearing them on their neck. So you can see this in many places. My bank account is right here. In Laguna Chica Huaca, traditional ways are still alive. The dress ways are still generational. A mother and her daughter. The same in San Martin Tuñoso, a neighboring village, also Trique. Uh, still long red blouses, but done in a different way. We call them Vigilis. Mother and daughter, dressed in absolute gorgeousness. In the central valleys of Oaxaca, Marta Gomez in the village of San Bartolome Tialana dresses. Another village where multiple generations, they call it living threads, generation after generation, still dresses in this way. Everybody in the village still dresses in this way. Um, you will see variants. She's a young woman, she wears this kind of top. Her mother wears this kind of top, slightly different, you know, I dress differently than my father does as well. This is uh, in the high Mixteca region of Oaxaca. This woman is Selena Cruz, the village of San Pablo Quijote. Now this village is kind of astounding to me because it is in a region where all the neighboring villages have lost their dress ways. They dress in the clothing that you buy in the market, generic clothing, clothing brought from somewhere else. But in this village and in this one village, they make their clothing very, very laborious, carefully made, beautiful, and rich with design and color. Same village, this is Juana Bautista, San Pablo Tijaltepec. And she told me, like so many women, I learned to make my clothing from my mother. She learned from her mother before her. And as she's telling me this, she's cooking something in the kitchen. She ran a little shop in the market. And she's sort of distracted, but she's telling me about her clothing. And she stops for a moment. And she pauses and she looks at me. And I could just see some feeling move through her. She says, you know, clothing is my memory. And then she went back to doing whatever she was doing as if what she had just said wasn't one of the most beautiful, profound things I'd heard, making a tortilla or cooking egg, whatever she was doing. And I was stuck with that. My clothing is my memory. It carries in it so much history. It carries in it my mother. It carries in it my ancestors. It carries in it my childhood. It carries in it all its life. This is Fernanda Sanchez of Tehuantepec. She was a colonel. She was a colonel in the Mexican army for years and years and years, and she lived in Mexico City. She told me when I retired and came home, putting on our clothing, I felt like putting my skin back. Ah. We were talking about purple shell dyeing before we officially went on. This woman is wearing a posawanco tied with, with the ink of the purple shellfish. Her name is Socorro Paulina. And they photographed her in a holy place outside of her village. Pinotepa de Don Luis. And you can 
see she is surrounded by sacred symbols that Posa Wonk that she wears, which is iconic of her village, which she wove herself of cotton and silk. Her husband, Abapuk Avendaño, is the man who went and dyed the purple color in that. The red is from a different source, that burgundy red, but the purple is from the shelter. This is this iconic wrap of the village. Ah. And she said, we are married and buried in our best postal one. Yes, so mean. At her side, you can see the cross, the symbol of a religion brought to Mexico by the Spanish 500 years ago. And behind her, a giant saber tree, an ancient emblem of sacred Mesoamerica. Her roots reaching into the loaming underworld of spirits and origins, and the trunk being the realm of people of the present, and the branches of the home of the gods. Where she stands, look at her, bare feet touching the ground that is her divine place on earth. That ground that is her one divine place on earth, her home. One of the most common stories that I heard as I traveled was of old ways disappeared. For example, this gentleman told me that when he was younger, he used to dress in the traditional way of his village. But my kids moved, they moved away to the city. And they started sending me store-bought clothing, he told me. I got used to it. There are lots of reasons for that. Sometimes manufactured clothing is cheaper. Sometimes it's more comfortable. Sometimes it's more hip. Sometimes it's even better made. But also, to be indigenous in Mexico, like in so many places, is to be subjected to discrimination. To wear the costume of the outside world is to avoid some of that discrimination, to blend in and disappear and lose the uniqueness. But there is a soul felt comfort in wearing the clothing of one's heritage. You can see it in this. But it is disappearing. In this village, Yalalag, for example, there are only 40 women who, who still dress in the style of their village on a day to day basis. I want you to look out behind her. That is the Valley of White Cranes. That is the Valley of White Cranes, village after village, white on white on. This is Isa Soyaltepec. In Isa Soyaltepec, there are only a dozen women who still dress in the way of their place. And in Solaga, only four. And when it's gone, I began by speaking of meeting some of the most beautiful grandmothers in the world. Now it's worth mentioning that in some of the villages I visited, community fashion is alive and well. We shared some of those. But in two thirds of the 57 villages I visited, the only people I could find who still dress in the fashion of their community were their grandmothers. By the time their daughters were born, 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, things had begun to change. The fast moving outside world had begun to flood in. These beautiful women of silver hair and braids and ribbons, of well-earned wrinkles and deeply rooted fashion, will almost certainly be the last generation to dress in the clothing of their place of origin and all that it symbolizes. For me, their beauty isn't just in the way they dress or in the insights gained in their years of living, though I find both to be gorgeous, but also in that they carry in their collective experience the unspoken knowledge of old and rooted and slow moving humanity. They are literally the grandmothers of the human world, the wise old ones. And they are beginning to die. What is lost? What is lost when you no longer dress in the clothing that spoke of your own deep history? When the food on your plate has become generic and your language, the intonations of your parents and grandparents has gone extinct. Does it even matter? Are these just old fashioned relics in a modern world? Perhaps so. Or maybe with the loss, a yearning appears, growing like a hunger over generations, where once there was something, a long forgotten birthright called connection and belonging. Once there was something, but you can't quite mean it. It is only defined by a negative space inside. And emptiness. I think of the Seba tree, once held in such reverence in places like Oaxaca, with its strong roots firmly rooted 
in the soil, a solid trunk and those upward reaching branches. One might think of soil as history, composed of eroded stones and life that has been, decayed leaves and trunks and the expired hearts of every living being, that which was the past. And the roots go into this and feed off of it, the fertile compost of layer upon layer of being and experience, its energy being recycled into the present once again. The past is the food of tomorrow. The past is the food of tomorrow. And at the other extreme are the branches reaching for the stars. And specifically our most important star, the sun. Branches reaching upwards towards that golden power, upwards towards potential, upwards towards some unknown future into the blue. The trunk connects the two, acting as a conduit of these very different sources of energy, a link between the grounding roots and the upward reaching branches. A whole, of course, creating a perfect balance. Those of us here, wrapped in this bedazzling and astounding journey called Western civilization, I think of us as the branches, reaching, reaching, reaching for that potential, for some unknown future, for that energized, golden sunlight. Reaching. But I believe we have forgotten our roots. So I share this story for the beautiful grandma, grandmothers and grandfathers, for all the people who are part of the chorus of many languages and the rich, singular, and idiosyncratic ways of dressing, eating, and gathering, it is a recognition of those that are fast moving ways overlooked, or worse, overrun, grandmother cultures. Those who haven't forgotten the slow learn, wise lessons about belonging to this precious gift called Earth and connection to each other. From my tumbleweed roots and the depths of my sagebrush scented heart, I thank the people of Oaxaca for what they have shared with me. We need them. They who are the deep and ancient roots in the lowly soil. And perhaps if we can be quiet and humble and listen, their layers of knowledge will help our collective tree from falling over. And this story is for you too. What is the scent of your heart? What do, where do your feet touch the ground? What is your sacred place on this? These are questions well worth asking while we listen for the whispers, the wise old ones. And with that, I say to all of you, thank you for listening to these stories. Thank you for sharing in some of what I've learned from the people that I've had the joy of meeting out there in the world. Some of it go inside and some of it hold. And may we appreciate and honor these amazing old timers who are among us and all over this planet. Thank you very much. With that, I close and let's open it up to questions and dialogue. And I'm gonna stop screen sharing but before I do, one last thing. Um, that, and then, then we'll take this out of the way. Contact information. Um, you can take a photo of that. You can take a screenshot and it becomes like a business card. I'll just quickly say that my website on the top, my email address, write me a letter. I love being in touch with people. In the middle, Living Thread Studio. If you ever come to Santa Fe, come and visit. Um, myself and my partner have a studio space here where I show my photography and we highlight handmade natural fiber textiles, 1610D Lena Street, Santa Fe. And below, if you're Instagram savvy, those are our Instagram handles. Um, so that's where we can stay in touch.